Allow me to say that it is a special joy to me that I may be part of this conference of the British Reformed Fellowship. For one thing, it is a joy to witness and to be part of God's blessing of the British Reformed Fellowship. As the one who introduced me mentioned, the very first meeting, a kind of exploratory meeting, of what became the British Reformed Fellowship was held in 1990 in the north of Wales, and it was my privilege to speak at that first conference. The attendance at that first conference was small, enough to warrant continuing the project, but very small. And obviously, God has granted significant growth to the conferences that are held by the British Reform Fellowship. That is joy to me as it is to the others. The conference has been held without fail every two years from 1990. What makes the British Reformed Fellowship Conference especially worthwhile, as far as I am concerned, is that it brings together for a week of fellowship about the Word of God Men and women and young people, not only from the British Isles, but also now from all over the world. Men and women and young people who believe and love the Reformed or Presbyterian faith of Holy Scripture. And that is, that is only a long way to say men and women and young people who love the gospel of the grace of God as revealed in Holy Scripture. For me personally, there is this also about these conferences, and I speak for my wife as well, that they enable us to meet and speak with face to face friends, brothers, and sisters in Christ, whom we only see and have fellowship every two years at these conferences. Another reason for my personal joy at being present again at this conference is that I count it a privilege to be able to develop and witness to the various subjects that are the themes of these conferences. There is no doubt that the main feature of these conferences all these many years has been the development of and the witness to various truths of the Word of God, chosen, I might add, by those who attend these conferences. By this time, we have studied a goodly number of outstanding truths of the Word of God. The Word of God has been sounded out to the people at the conference, and by these people I trust to their circle of family and friends when they return to their own homes. And in later years, the word of God that is taught at this conference has been spread also by means of the publication of the speeches and sermons at the conference in nicely bound books that find their way all over the world. The Word of God, therefore, goes out from this conference as it would not otherwise go out. And if this not, does not give joy to a believer, I don't think anything could possibly give joy to a believing child of God. The matter of the subjects of this conference leads me to express yet another joy I have at being part of this conference, and that is that the particular subject that we study at this conference is the doctrine of the last things, or eschatology. And in my ministry, in the providence of God, I have had developed in me a special interest in and love for that particular aspect of the gospel of the grace of God, the truth of the last things. 
That's partly due to God's putting me in circumstances in which I had to contend for the truth of eschatology against the leading errors concerning the last things. During my rather long pastorate in the environs of Chicago, Illinois, I had to confront a very powerful testimony to premillennial dispensationalism. Prominent and powerful in Chicago, Illinois, is the ministry of the Moody Bible Institute, MBI, one of the most vigorous proponents of premillennial dispensationalism, and if that's an unfamiliar term to you, I assure you it will not be an unfamiliar term at the end of this conference, but in any case, that institution vigorously promotes premillennial dispensationalism. And that witness, especially by the radio, has an effect upon reformed Christians in the area of Chicago, Illinois. At the same time, over the past 30 or more years, there has been a powerful promulgation of the teaching of post-millennialism by certain reformed theologians and ministers who are part of a movement that calls itself Christian Reconstruction. Without going to, into any detail here, I limit myself to saying that the movement of Christian Reconstruction is a movement that vigorously promotes the teaching of post-millennialism and for various reasons and in various ways I have had to cross swords with that movement and with some of the outstanding theologians in that, mu in that movement. All of that and more has had the effect of giving me a special interest in the biblical doctrine of the last things. In fact, at the present time, the Reformed Free Publishing Association, the publishing arm of the Protestant Reformed Churches, has a manuscript of mine which I intend to be the first of three volumes covering the entirety of the biblical teaching of the last things according to the Reformed understanding of the last things. But there is more that explains my special interest in the truth of the last things, and that more is that I am increasingly convinced, in view of the signs of the times that I will speak on tonight, the end of all things and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is very near. What I mean by nearness I will explain in my speech tonight. The signs show that the coming of Christ and the end of all things are very near. In addition, all of us certainly can agree that the end of history and of creation is the great goal or purpose of God with all of creation, with all of history, and with all of the work of salvation itself. The end will mean that God finally attains the goal that he purposed with creation itself and that he also has purposed, purposed with the salvation of his people. The end of all things is the goal of all things. And the goal or final purpose of all things is important. My specific topic tonight is the quick and second coming of Jesus Christ, the signs. I will show from the Bible that there are signs of the coming of Christ, which those signs are, and how Reformed Christians, all believers in fact, ought to observe these signs. Certain of these signs I will emphasize because of their importance and because we can see these signs so plainly in the world today. 
It is the purpose of Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 that we see the signs and that we see the signs with spiritual understanding. A sign, also a biblical sign, is a visible representation of an invisible reality. We're all familiar with that. A flag is the visible representation of the nation whose flag it is. And so important is that, that if one burns a flag or drags the flag of a country through the mud, there is and ought to be a punishment for such a citizen for defiling not only a piece, a piece of cloth, but for defiling and holding in contempt the nation represented by that flag. Also, a sign can be a visible warning of an invisible danger. Again, we are all familiar with that. Driving down the highway, you see on the side of the road a sign with a sharp arrow bent. And you understand that that sign is warning of the danger of a sharp turn ahead so that you're prepared to make that turn rather than to run your vehicle into a tree on the side of a road. Now the signs of the second coming of Christ are signs in both of those senses. A sign of the coming of Christ is a visible representation of the as yet invisible reality of the coming of Christ on the clouds of heaven. And in view of those things that are going to transpire before Christ returns, a sign of the coming of Christ is a signal of warning concerning dangers that lie ahead prior to and in connection with the second coming of Jesus Christ. There will be a visible bodily coming of Jesus Christ in the future on the clouds of heaven, surrounded by tens of thousands of his mighty angels. That is the heart and center of the truth of eschatology. As the angels promised to the disciples upon Jesus' ascension into heaven, in the opening chapter of the book of Acts, he whom you have seen departing into heaven will come again, even as you have seen him go into heaven. And at that second coming of Jesus Christ, tremendous things will take place. The overthrow and destruction of the forces of darkness, Satan and his hosts, once and for all. The resurrection first of the dead believers, and then also of all the dead, in order to undergo a final judgment, in which judgment Jesus Christ will be the judge. Also belonging to that event is the destruction by fire of the present form of the earthly creation, and then the recreation of this present creation to be the far more glorious and then everlasting habitation of King Jesus and the citizens of his kingdom. Of that second coming of Jesus Christ, there are signs. Now, not every church and not every Christian agrees with me and you, I trust, that there are and will be signs of Christ's second coming. In fact, this may startle you, in fact, most churches and most professing Christians deny that there are and will be signs of the end, signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, with the rare exception, only the Reformed faith 
teaches that there are and will be signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ and of the end. And the Reformed faith teaches virtually uniquely that there are and will be signs because only the Reformed faith is amillennial. Now don't be scared, boys and girls and young people, by that big word. And don't suppose, you adults, that this is now going to become a deep, dark, theological discourse. But I have to use that word because that word is important and every Reformed or Presbyterian Christian should be familiar with that term and what that term means. I will explain that term later on. But I repeat, and this is worth knowing and remembering, only the Reformed faith teaches that there are signs of the second coming of Christ because the Reformed faith, when I say Reformed faith, I mean the faith that holds the Reformed confessions and the Presbyterian confessions. Only the Reformed faith is a millennial. Fundamental to the truth about the signs is a right understanding of the truth of the millennium. The millennium is mentioned in Revelation 20, another very important chapter concerning my topic tonight and concerning the entire truth of eschatology. Revelation 20 teaches that there is a millennium. Millennium is the Latin word meaning 1,000 years. Revelation 20 speaks several times of a period that it refers to as 1,000 years. During this millennium, or 1,000 years, several important events will take place. First, Satan is bound so that he cannot deceive the nations. That first. Notice well, He's not bound so that he can't do anything. He's not bound so that he cannot deceive the nations. Second, during the millennium, the people of God who suffer and die for the sake of Jesus Christ immediately in their soul live and reign with Jesus Christ on thrones in heaven. That reigning by the souls of the dead saints takes place in heaven. Very definitely, Revelation 20 says that they sit on thrones in heaven, not on earth. And then, after the millennium, when the millennium is over, when the thousand-year period is ended, Satan will gather all the nations of the world, that is, all the wicked who are the majority in all the nations of the world, for one last great all-out assault upon the church of Jesus Christ and those who belong to the church of Jesus Christ. And the church of Jesus Christ is described symbolically in that passage as the beloved city. There are basically two explanations of the thousand years of Revelation 20. One of those explanations is that that thousand year period or millennium will be a period in history. A period the events of which are taking place on the earth. And that that thousand year period within history is still in the future. And that during that period, Jesus Christ will set up an earthly kingdom in which his people will exercise dominion over all the earth, over all the world. And during which the people of Christ will enjoy earthly peace and earthly prosperity. 
I may sum all of that up very briefly this way. One explanation of the thousand years of Revelation 20 is that it refers to a golden age for the people of God on earth during history before the end of all things. I call that explanation of the thousand year period millennialism. Millennialism. The ism is intended to indicate that that explanation is a distorted and inaccurate and false explanation of the millennium. Now that millennialism that speaks of a golden age for the people of God in history takes two main forms. There are two main forms of millennialism. One of those forms we call pre-millennialism because this teaching holds that Christ will come bodily and visibly from heaven before the millennium, before the thousand year period so that Jesus himself personally and visibly will be seated on an earthly throne in the world, reigning over all the world. Premillennialism teaches that Jesus will return to set up his kingdom himself personally as a restored kingdom of the Jews with its headquarter in Jerusalem. This is a very popular view of eschatology and a very popular es explanation of the millennium of Revelation 20. Pre-millennialism. Often that view is further described as dispensationalism because basic to that understanding of the last things is that History is divided into distinct and even separate dispensations or ages. There was the dispensation of Old Testament Israel. That ended with the coming of Christ. Now we're in the dispensation of the church. And in the future, when Christ returns bodily from heaven, he will come to restore that Old Testament kingdom of the Jews, of Israel. Literally and physically in Jerusalem. That is one view that belongs to what I call millennialism. But there is a second distinct teaching that also explains the millennium of Revelation 20 as a golden age for the people of God on earth before history ends. And that view calls itself and is called post-millennialism. You figured out by this time that it's called post-millennialism because this view teaches that Jesus Christ will come after the thousand year period of Revelation 20, after the golden age. According to this view, and we ought to pay special attention to this view because this view is also found among some Reformed and some Presbyterians. This view teaches that gradually, as history continues, almost the entire human race will be converted by the gospel and become Christian. The Christians, therefore, being in the vast majority, will take over the government of all the nations of the world. And for a thousand years, and some of them become ecstatic about this and even talk of hundreds of thousands of years, the church will dominate earthly civilization. Because the church dominates all of earthly population will live in peace and prosperity and earthly power. Then when that millennium ends, that earthly kingdom of Christ ends also, and then eternity will set in. 
Now, I'm not going to launch into a critique of these errors. I'm going to content myself with a positive explanation tonight for the most part of the truth of the last things. But I want to call your attention to one feature of post-millennialism. I can't restrain myself from doing that. There's an absurdity in that position that is not always noticed. And that is that this earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is supposed to last for a thousand years, is the oddest earthly kingdom that has ever existed in the history of mankind. The king isn't there. While this earthly kingdom is holding forth on earth, Jesus is in heaven, far away, invisible. There's never been a kingdom like that, and certainly not a great kingdom. Every great kingdom in history has very definitely had a powerful and charismatic, in the right sense of the word now, and effective king sitting upon the throne of his kingdom. Postmillennialism banishes Jesus far away where he can't be seen so that earthly lords will rule over his kingdom for a thousand years. And finally, when his kingdom comes to an end, then finally we see the king coming on the clouds of heaven. Very strange kingdom. But that's one explanation of the millennium of Revelation 20. Millennialism, distinguished as premillennialism and postmillennialism. Having this in common, that both of them teach that eschatology is mainly about a literal earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ within history. There's another explanation of the millennium or thousand years of Revelation 20. And that's the reformed explanation of that thousand year period. The thousand year period of Revelation 20 is a symbolic description of the present age from the ascension of Jesus Christ until just before he personally and bodily returns on the clouds of heaven. The millennium, therefore, is not a literal period of time. 1,000 is rather a symbolic description of the present age. And because this view denies a thousand-year golden age, this view is called and calls itself amillennialism. Not the happiest description because... Ah, uh, millennialism literally means not a millennium. And of course, we don't deny that there is that thousand-year period of Revelation 20, but we're denying that that thousand-year period is a literal period of time in which Christ establishes an earthly kingdom and a golden age within history. Nowhere in the Reformed Confessions is there any teaching that lends itself even to millennialism, whether premillennialism or postmillennialism. On the contrary, the Reformed Confessions teach the truth of amillennialism. I want to quote just one exemplary passage from the creeds. What Reformed Christians believe about the millennium and about the last days you can find in question and answer 52 of the Heidelberg Catechism. What comfort is it to thee that, quote, Christ shall come again to judge the quick and dead? Now notice this answer, which is the answer put in the mouth of every believer throughout all of New Testament history until the very appearing of Jesus Christ. That in all my sorrows and persecutions, I look for Jesus Christ who shall cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation. End of quote. That confession puts the church and every member of the church in circumstances of opposition and persecution by an ungodly world until the very appearing 
of Jesus Christ. Notice what the answer is not. Answer to the question, what comfort is it to thee that Christ shall come again to judge the quick and the dead? That before He comes, I and all His people in all the world will exercise physical dominion over all nations and live happily on earth and in earthly history in circumstances of earthly peace and prosperity. That's not the answer. Rather, that in all my sorrows and persecutions, I look for the coming of Jesus Christ. Now both forms of what I call millennialism deny that there are any signs that the church or that the Christian can and should see that point to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Both premillennialism and postmillennialism deny that there are any signs that we ought to see that indicate the coming of Jesus Christ. Premillennialism denies any signs because it teaches that Christ will come for the church at any moment in what they call the secret rapture. At any moment implies that there are no signs at all Ask a premillennial theologian, what about the signs of Matthew 24? And he will say to you, those don't apply to the church at all. Those apply only to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. The Jews will suffer at the hands of the Antichrist. And the Jews will suffer persecution. The church by that time will have been taken up into the air, into heavenly places in the secret rapture. What the Bible teaches about signs will happen to the Jews. I want to quote one representative premillennialist, recognized by the premillennialists as one of their outstanding theologians, John F. Walford, in his book, The Rapture Question. I quote, The hope of the return of Christ to take the saints to heaven is an imminent hope. There is no teaching of any intervening event. The prospect of being taken to heaven at the coming of Christ, that's the rapture, is not qualified by description of any signs or prerequisite events. End of quote. But also post-millennialism denies and must deny that there are any signs of the second coming of Christ. For post-millennialism, the future is the gradual conversion of most people and the Christianizing of the whole world, a golden age of at least 1,000 years. There's no room in that view for such signs as antichrist and persecution for the church of Jesus Christ. The church is going to be dominant in the world. Nobody's going to be able to persecute the church. When you ask the post-millennialist, what about the teaching of the Bible concerning Antichrist and concerning the persecution of the church, he will answer, that all took place in the past. That applies to the time of the Roman Empire and its persecution of the early church. Or perhaps to the time of the Reformation. Again, listen to one of the leading post-millennial theologians, Gary DeMar. On the subject now of signs, I quote, Can we point to any signs that would indicate that Jesus' coming is imminent? The answer is no. There are no observable signs leading up to his bodily return. End of quote. That explanation of Revelation 20 allows for no signs. Only the Reformed faith, that is the amillennial doctrine of the last things, does justice to the Bible's teaching that there are signs of Christ's coming that we must observe. Now notice how serious matters get. If we are convinced that there are no signs that tell us of the soon coming of Jesus Christ, we won't look for those signs. 
We won't even see those signs when they are before our eyes because we have ruled all signs out. And therefore, these tremendous events that are beginning to take place already will come upon us unprepared. And that is dangerous for anyone who confesses the name of Christ. Christ taught that there are signs, and he taught that in Matthew 24, which we have read, an extremely important passage on the truth of the last things, particularly the signs. His disciples asked him this question concerning the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Verse 3. In response, Jesus gave to his disciples and to us a number of signs. After he had forewarned them of these events, many of which involved suffering by the children of God, the disciples of Christ, and many of, what, of which involved dangers for the church of Christ in the world, Christ said to the disciples and to us in verse 33, quote, When ye shall see all these things, Know that it, his coming, is near, even at the doors. End of quote. Another passage that clearly and conclusively establishes that there are signs of the coming of Christ, signs for the Christian, signs for the church, not signs for the Jews. Another important passage is 2 Thessalonians 2. Verses 1 through 3. I repeat, because of the importance of that passage for our subject tonight, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 3. In that passage, the subject is the coming of Christ, which will gather all the church unto Christ. Verse 1. That day of Christ is not, quote, at hand, end quote. That is, that day of Christ or coming of Christ is not imminent, is not expected to take place at any moment. Verse 2. To teach in the Apostles' day that the coming of Christ was imminent or could take place at any moment would be to deceive the church and to shake the members of the church up. And trouble them. Verse 2. And that's the exact refutation of premillennial dispensationalism. Paul says that the coming of Christ is not imminent. Cannot take place at any moment. Premillennialism says it is imminent. It could take place at any moment. The passage makes, makes plain to the church at that time that the end of the world is distant from the apostolic church, as we know it was at least 2,000 years distant from the church to which the apostle addressed that letter to the Thessalonians. But we also may not think that Jesus could come at any moment. Before the return of Christ, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, two tremendous events must take place. One in the sphere of the church and the other in the realm of the nations of the world. I quote now, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. End of quote. And that is verse 3 of Second Thessalonians 2. On the basis of this passage, as every believer, for every believer has the ability to understand the Bible, on the basis of this passage, as every believer is able to understand, the coming of Christ is preceded by two events that are to be signs to the church that his coming is a reality and that his coming is, in the biblical sense, near. Two things. A great falling away within the nominal church and the appearance of the man of sin. Those are signs. Those are signs that the church 
must see. And concerning that man of sin, in 2 Thessalonians 2, in verse 8 of that chapter, he is called, according to the King James translation, that wicked or wicked one. And literally, the apostle speaks there of that lawless one. The man of sin who must appear before the return of Christ is the lawless one. Those are two of the signs of the coming of Christ. But there are others. All of the signs are tremendous, public, world-shaking events in three areas of God's creation and of human life. First, the signs are catastrophes in what we may call nature. Catastrophes in nature. In Matthew 24, Jesus spoke of famines, diseases, and earthquakes. The book of Revelation speaks of more and other catastrophes in creation. Second, the signs are alarming developments in the world of nations. First, catastrophes in creation. Second, alarming developments in the world of nations. They include wars among the nations of the world, wars which end in the uniting of all nations against the church of Jesus Christ, as Christ warns in Matthew 24, verse 9, quote, Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, end of quote. Remember the question in Matthew 24 that occasioned this remark by Christ was, Master, what are the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Where does the dream of an earthly victory of the church and of a golden age of the church in history during which the church reigns over all the nations of the world, how does that fit with this prophecy of the church's being hated of all nations for my name's sake? Then especially the book of Revelation forewarns the church that one of the things that must come to pass is the emerging emergence of the world power of the beast. That's Antichrist. That's the, devil, the devil's kingdom of man which is opposed to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the Antichrist is that kingdom of Satan headed, importantly, by one powerful, gifted, and demonic human being. Especially Revelation 12 and 13 speak of the emergence of the kingdom of the beast. This world power of Satan will unleash the great tribulation against the elect of God. That's the prophecy of Christ in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. A tribulation or a persecution the like of which there has never occurred up till then in all the history of the world. The church must know this. The church must know this so that the church is prepared for this final struggle of the church against the all-out attack upon the church of Christ by Satan. But that's a second sphere of the signs of the end. Developments in the world of nations. And then third... The signs have to do with great happenings in the church. And here I use the word church broadly, not only the true church, but also all that has the name and appearance of church in the world. For one thing, and this applies to the church in the sense of the elect body of Christ, the church will be victorious in that she will preach the gospel in all the world for a witness to all nations, so that all of the elect of God are gathered 
unto Christ out of all nations. That's Matthew 24, verse 14. We emphasize this. The church is victorious. The church will be victorious. One of the signs of the end of all things is the real victory of the church in that all of the members of the church are regenerated and brought to faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, false prophets and false Christs will deceive many. That's Matthew 24, verses 11 and 24. You recognize that this sign belongs to the sphere of the nominal church. False prophets and false Christs are not found in the world of the ungodly out there, but they appear within that which has the name of church. Also, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew 24, verse 12. That's a prophecy of apostasy, of the corruption of sound doctrine, the perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then the falling away of many who had the name of Christian to the ungodly world. I remind us that that falling away can refer to individuals who had the name of believer when in fact they were not a believer at all, but it can also refer to developments within the generations of two who were believers. God gathers his church in the line of generations in the line of believers who faithfully confess his name and teach their children the truth of Christ, God gathers his elect out of those children. But at the same time, when two parents, believers, show themselves weak, then that weakness shows up in the perishing in unbelief of their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, so that this falling away takes place in the generations of those who themselves were true believers. A warning to us parents to be staunch in our confession of the truth of the gospel. A warning to us parents to instruct our children in the truth of God and of Jesus Christ. And a warning to us parents to admonish our children to keep themselves from ungodly friends as much as is possible for us to do. God uses those activities as means to gather his children out of our children and grandchildren. The third phenomenon to be found within the sphere of the church is that the church will suffer great persecution. That also belongs to the signs with regard now to the sphere of the church. The church will suffer great tribulation or great persecution. That's Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. I want to single out three of the signs now for special attention which they deserve. The primary sign of the coming of Christ. We may never lose sight of this, the sign that not only shows the, near, shows the nearness of the end, but also determines the nearness of the end, is the preaching of the gospel throughout all the world. Before the end, the gospel will be preached throughout all the world. That's Matthew 24, verse 14. Then shall the end come, and not before. Because all of God's elect people must be gathered out of all the nations. Not one may remain unconverted and unsaved. The church determines the history of the world. The church determines the time of the end. Not the devil. Not Antichrist. Not the false church. The church. The gospel has a work to do. And only when that work of the gospel is accomplished, can Christ return? According to 2 Thessalonians 2, there is in fact a restraining, I think the unfortunate translation in the King James Version is letting, but the thought is restraining. There is a work by God the Holy Spirit 
in providence of restraining the coming of the Antichrist. The thought is vivid throughout all of New Testament history. And at this present moment, Satan, the God of this world, has one burning desire. Establish my world kingdom under my false Christ, the Antichrist. If Satan would have his way, the Antichrist would be on the scene today or yesterday. But there's one who restrains. And that's God the Holy Spirit by controlling all the affairs of human history so that the Antichrist, the man of sin, cannot come today or tomorrow or until the very day in which God has appointed that he may come. And the reason is the church must be gathered on the mission field and out of the children of believing parents. Otherwise, God's great purpose of the saving of his elect church is frustrated. And that will not and can never take place. Right along with the triumphant course of the gospel, there is also the sign of apostasy in and of the churches. That's the sign that Christ spoke of in Matthew 24 when he prophesied that false prophets would deceive many and that the love of many would grow cold. Paul spoke of this as one of the two things that must take place before the day of Christ when he said that there must be a falling away first. Falling away, apostasy, being deceived, and the cooling of the love of many all refer to the same thing. Those who once confess Christ according to the truth those who were once members of true churches of Jesus Christ, those who once confessed the truths of the gospel, fall away. Fall away from the gospel. Don't confess it anymore. Probably pervert it and corrupt it. Abandon the true church. And deny Jesus Christ whom they once confessed. What causes this may be persecution that they would undergo if they continued faithful, or the influence of false teachers upon them, or simply the love of the world, the pleasures of the world, which are outlawed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then a third dramatic sign that I want to isolate will be the Antichrist. Revelation 13 teaches that the Antichrist in its full reality will be a world of united nations under one devilish man. That will be Satan's kingdom reared up against the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And heading that satanic kingdom will be a man whom I would describe as one in whom Satan comes as close as he can to God's incarnation of himself in Jesus Christ. Satan, after all, is an ape, a mimic, a diabolical mimic of God and his working. It pleased God to establish his kingdom by the incarnation of himself in Jesus. Satan mimics that act of God and gives to a certain man all that Satan can give of his own demonic spirit. He can't incarnate himself. That's a wonder that belongs only to God. But the Bible does teach about the Antichrist, the personal Antichrist, that in him will be worked by Satan, all that Satan can work in one human being of his own demonic shrewdness, of his own demonic hatred of God and Christ and the true church. 
And also that Satan can work in a human being of his own tremendous supernatural powers. The book of Revelation, after all, says about the Antichrist that he will perform wonders that also amaze his followers. At the end, at the end of the millennium, the thousand year period, just before the very end of history and of the world, Satan will be loosed for a little season to deceive the nations and to make his final attack upon the kingdom and church of Jesus Christ. For a little while, because that time will be shortened. Lest the very elect of God would be deceived. For a little while, Satan will maintain his kingdom. And God will permit that worldwide rule of the man of sin. The Christ will bring an abrupt halt by awful judgments upon the kingdom of the beast, breaking it up and destroying it so that evident in history is that Satan could not accomplish a lasting world kingdom. Only Christ can do that by his cross, his resurrection, and the spirit of truth. Then Christ in the body will appear in heaven for all to see. Now concerning these signs, notice that they do not only show that Christ is coming, and that his coming is near, but they also are the means by which Christ comes. We shouldn't think of the signs of the end as we think of a sign on the side of the road that says Belfast, 50 miles, or does it say 50 kilometers here? And then pretty soon another sign on the side of the road that says Belfast, 25 miles. All that those signs do is tell you how far it is to Belfast, and that Belfast is up there somewhere in the distance. They don't bring Belfast any nearer. But the signs of the end that Christ teaches in Matthew 24 and that are taught elsewhere in the Bible are signs in such a way that they actually bring the coming of Christ closer. They actually realize the soon coming of Jesus Christ. For Christ is constantly coming ever since he ascended into heaven. And he's coming as quickly as he possibly can. He's coming through the preaching of the gospel that gathers the church. And he's coming even through the persecution of his church by the ungodly. All of the signs bring about quickly the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate that. Christ cannot come until every one of his elect is brought to repentance and saved. Therefore, the gospel must be preached in all nations for a witness. And by that preaching, Christ is coming. Again, Christ can come only when the wicked world has completely filled its cup of iniquity so that God may be just when he judges in the final judgment. When Antichrist reigns, performs all his horrors, especially in the persecution of the church. Christ is realizing his own coming in the way of the fulfillment of the cup of iniquity by the wicked. And Christ can come only when he fills up the measure of his sufferings and the persecution and death of his people. That sometimes is a strange teaching to Reformed Christians. We fill up the measure of the sufferings of Christ? That's a biblical expression found in the epistle to the Colossians. Some sufferings are saved up for the church 
all of the suffering that was necessary for the redemption of the church, Christ has accomplished. They're finished. We have nothing to do with that. But there's also this about the sufferings of Jesus Christ, that they are a witness to the goodness of God as maintained by his children in the world, even in the face of suffering. Christ endured a great deal of that suffering, but not all of it. He's left some of that suffering for his children to endure. It is therefore a privilege for the Christian to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Here again, we mustn't think this way as we're tempted to do. Oh, I hope that the coming of Antichrist and the great persecution do not come in my day or in the day of my children or even of my grandchildren as though we're averse to suffering for Christ's sake. It's a privilege to suffer for Christ's sake. It's a privilege to fill up the measure of the sufferings of Jesus Christ in the world by suffering for the sake of maintaining his gospel and walking in his ways. These sufferings are also part of the way in which Jesus Christ brings about his own second coming. He can't come until all of his sufferings in the world are completed. Remember when the souls under the altar in Revelation cry out, How long, O Lord, before you avenge our sufferings by destroying the wicked? The answer comes back from God, be patient until your brothers on earth are also killed. Revelation 6, verses 10 and 11. To be slain for the sake of Christ is a great privilege. Notice second about the signs that they show that the day of Christ is near near to us in the year 2016. The day of Christ has always been near in the sense that after Christ ascended into heaven, the next great item in God's agenda has been the second coming of Jesus Christ. And God has so directed history with a view to the coming of Christ that all that takes place in history has in view to bring about as quickly as possible the second coming of Jesus Christ. But in the year A.D. 2016, it is evident from the signs given in Scripture that the day of Christ and the end of all things is very near indeed, and that we must live in expectation of that coming of Jesus Christ. He is very near. Outstanding signs of His coming are fulfilling now as we sit here, as never before in the history of the world. For one thing, The gospel has been preached nearly in all the world for a witness. And Jesus himself says that when this happens, then shall the end be. There's also, at the same time, great apostasy. Rome has fallen away and become the false church. Since the time of the Reformation... Liberalism has swept millions of professing Christians away. Arminianism has deceived millions more of professing Christians with its false gospel. The charismatic movement today with its signs and wonders bewitches millions of others. And grievous heresies are now destroying once conservative Presbyterian and Reformed churches. There's a questioning of the inspiration of Scripture. There's a denial of the biblical account of creation in six days of one evening and one morning apiece. There's an attack upon the doctrine of particular sovereign grace by the refusal to preach and confess predestination, both election and and reprobation. And recently, Mirabile Dictu, wonderful to relate, 
There is in Presbyterian and Reformed churches with the most glorious reputation the denial of justification by faith alone, the fundamental of the gospel of grace. That's apostasy. That's a sign of the falling away of many. As is always the case, accompanying these false teachings are vile wickednesses of life on the part now of members of nominal Christian churches. This wickedness is not treated with Christian discipline. It's rather defended by the churches where this wickedness is to be found. The lives of the members of the churches are not governed by the Ten Commandments of the law of God. In Matthew 24, Jesus forewarned that a sign of the end would be this, that, quote, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, end of quote. Verse 12. And iniquity in that text is literally lawlessness. Do we hear that? Lawlessness shall abound. In 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul teaches that there will be a falling away in the churches, he goes on to say that God will send many church people a strong delusion that they believe a lie because these people have pleasure in unrighteousness. That's a significant teaching. We often think of it this way, the relationship this way. First, a church departs in false doctrine, and that departure into false doctrine is followed by immorality of life. There's also this. Departure from sound doctrine is God's punishment of those who took pleasure in unrighteousness. Their lives were filthy. Their lives were lawless. They didn't want to live the narrow life of the child of God. And God visits that lawlessness with blinding them to the truth and hardening them in their false doctrine. What do we see in the churches today? You as well as I. We see the approval of young people living openly in fornication. I'm not talking now about young people falling into the sin of fornication, for which there is repentance and forgiveness, but I'm talking about young people shacking up, living together without marriage, and the church winks at the sin, and so do the members of the churches. We see approval of unbiblical divorce and remarriage after divorce often to another man's wife or to another man's husband, what the Bible calls adultery in Matthew 19 and in Luke 16. And now, almost unbelievably, in so-called Christian nations of the West, including my country, there is approval of sexual relations between persons of the same sex, what the Bible calls Perversity in the Supreme Court of the United States of America, that bastion of justice and truth, has decided that such relations, sodomite and lesbian relations, are to be viewed as holy, legitimate marriage relationships. And this says nothing about such things as Sabbath desecration, willful worship of God in the place of the worship he has prescribed, and more. Still another clear sign of the coming of Christ is the ecumenical movement. The churches are uniting, not on the basis of the truth, but in despite of the denial of the truth or indifference to the truth of the word of God. 
Protestant churches are openly working at reunion with the Roman Catholic Church. The churches are getting together with the pagan religions. United religion under the leadership of the Pope of Rome will be the beast from the earth that Revelation 13 prophesies. The handmaid for a while of the beast from the sea which is the political antichrist. And yet another sign fulfilling before our very eyes is the coming together of the nations of the world. The movement toward a one world government is well underway in the world today. Despite the troubles it has recently had, the European Union is an expression of this movement. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the more or less friendlier relations that the Soviet Union has with the West are an indication of this. The nations see or think they see that globalization, a new world order, the United Nations, is not only best for mankind but also necessary. God established the nations as separate entities. And all these developments are indications of the fulfillment of the signs of Holy Scripture. This is where we are, therefore, in the last days. We are deep in the period of the great falling away in the churches. And not long before the appearance of the Antichrist, Satan has already been loosed for a little season to launch his all-out of war the all-out war upon the church of Jesus Christ. These signs make it definite enough for us to be on our guard, and still they remain indefinite enough so that we do not know the day or the hour of the coming of Christ. At the end, then, the question is, how are we to observe these signs? What effect are these signs to have upon reformed, believing Christians? These signs can only be seen, only be observed by faith. Unbelievers see the signs all right. They are unmistakable. How does one not see the increasing lawlessness, apostasy of the churches, and the uniting of the nations? But the unbeliever does not see them as signs of the coming of Christ. To see them as signs of the coming of Christ requires that we view these events in the light of the Word of God that identifies them and that explains their appearance as signs of Christ's coming. But let us be sure that we see these signs in faith. We must notice these signs. When we hear of an earthquake in a part of the world, we mustn't say to ourselves only, well, one plate slid under another plate, perhaps in San Francisco. But we must say to ourselves and to each other, the earth is convulsed with the birth pangs to bring forth the second coming of Jesus Christ. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Revelation 8 verse 22. We may not ignore that conservative reformed churches take a decision permitting the teaching of justification by faith and by works, or that a reputed conservative Presbyterian denomination allows for the theory of evolution as the explanation of the origin of all things. But we must say to ourselves and to each other, the great falling away is taking place before our very eyes. That's what these appalling events signify. Seeing the signs in faith means also that they have a powerful spiritual effect upon our lives. We mustn't have only an academic interest in the biblical truth of the signs of the times. Specifically, and now I'm drawing directly from the Bible. The effect of these signs upon us must be 
first and mainly that we are watching for the second coming of Jesus Christ and watching in such a way that we make ourselves ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The great danger is that churches and professing Christians get all wrapped up in this life and forget about the coming of Jesus Christ. We must live as expecting the return of Christ. Second, with specific reference to apostasy, the effect of that apostasy must be upon us that we hold the traditions, quoting scripture, that is, maintain the truths of scripture, both doctrinal and ethical. Third, with specific reference to the great tribulation that is impending, we must prepare for it and prepare the youth of the church for this impending great persecution. It's the sin of both premillennialism and postmillennialism that they have no place in their theology for the great tribulation upon the church. Both of them excuse the church and the people of God from the great persecution that is coming. There is therefore no preparation for it, no readiness for that tribulation when it breaks out upon the church of Jesus Christ. We must stay spiritually prepared for that great exercise of our faith to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. And fourth, seeing the signs as evidence of Christ's coming means that we rejoice at these signs because they remind us of His coming and show us that His coming is near. We should be fearless As I said, so far from shrinking from that persecution, we hardly dare to hope that we might be counted worthy by God to suffer in that last great battle of the church in the world. We should be fearless, even at the very end, when Antichrist arises, and then when God pours out his judgments upon the seat of the beast, and the world comes apart, Then the ungodly are perplexed, men's hearts failing them for fear. Luke 21, verses 25 and 26. Ah, but it will be different for us. When these things, the signs, begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption. Your redemption draweth nigh. Luke 21, verse 28. I thank you for your attention.